Good evening and welcome to our Family Baptist Church Thursday night Bible hour. Uh, this would otherwise be our normal Thursday night Bible study and prayer fellowship. But of course, since what's been going on uh, these days in our nation with the coronavirus crisis, here we are Thursday night and uh, wonderful to be with you. Uh, we give God the thanks. And at this time, uh, like is our custom, we're going to sing a little bit before we get into the scriptures tonight. Uh, we're going to sing Stand Up for Jesus, song number 15. Stand Up for Jesus. And in this day and age, you got to take a stand. Take a stand for what you believe in. Take a stand for the Savior who you love, who we worship and believe in. And so we stand up for Jesus. Let's sing this. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict, in this his glorious day. Ye that are brave now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To those who vanquish evil, a crown of life shall be. They with the King of glory shall reign eternally. We're going to do another song. Lead me to Calvary, song number seven. Lead me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. I'm going to read these words to you. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee, even thy cup of grief to share. Thou hast borne all for me. 
May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for Thee, even Thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast borne all for me, lest I forget God's Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Listen, friends, if anyone ever told you that living the life of faith was going to be an easy road, a road without challenge and difficulty and tribulation. They told you a lie. I will tell you this. The life of faith, the life of fellowshipping and walking with Jesus Christ is the greatest, most blessed life that you can ever have. The greatest decision I've ever made and will ever make in my entire life was when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ when I got saved. However, there is a time where we must be willing to bear our cross for the Lord. And we will face tribulation. But again, uh, in Jesus Christ, we already have the victory. The road may be tough, but with all the difficulties, there are yet even greater blessings that await us. And so it is a joy to be with you tonight, a joy to sing these songs in worship and in reverence to the Savior. And at this time, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Before we pray, I want to call a couple things to your attention. Um, for a couple weeks now, we've been praying for Betty Santiago, and that's uh, Pedro Santiago's sister. And I'm pleased to report to you that uh, she's doing much better. She's talking. They, they're moving her out of ICU. She's doing a lot better. And we're grateful that the Lord is answering so mightily uh, in those prayers that we've prayed for her. On the other hand, uh, there is a family that's hurting now, and and I just saw her, uh, Jessica's name on the feed there. And uh, Juan Gonzalez uh, went home to be with the Lord. Uh, he didn't recover as we would have hoped. It appears that God had a different plan, that he wanted his child to be with him. And uh, so uh, although we rejoice that he knew Jesus Christ as Savior, we are also sorrow, sorrowful that we had to say goodbye to him and of course, their family is uh, struggling with that. And, and I, I want to ask you to pray for Jessica's family, uh, the family of uh, Juan Gonzalez. And, uh, and let me also ask for the church family to pray for Indra Harrigan. Uh, she's been dealing with some health issues. And uh, she would be very, very appreciative of your prayers. Uh, at this time, before we get into the Word of God, let's bow for prayer. Ask God's blessing and His help for these, and ask God to bless uh, His Word tonight. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank You for this day. Thank You for Your goodness and for Your mercies, Lord. We look to You. We believe in You, and we rejoice in You, dear Father, because we know that You are the God who hears and answers prayer, and You sent Your Son to give His life for the salvation of the world. We thank you, dear Father. Lord God, we ask uh, prayer for Jessica's family, Lord, in the passing of Juan Gonzalez, Lord. And uh, he survived by uh, her sister, his brother, and others. And Lord God, we ask comfort for them. And dear Father, we pray for healing for Indra, Lord God. She's a dear sister in our church. And we ask that you would heal her and uh, you give the doctors wisdom to, uh, to figure out what's wrong with her. And dear Father, we want to thank you for hearing the prayer on Betty's behalf, Lord. She's getting so much better. And for uh, Pedro, who's so concerned for her and requested the prayer for her, dear Father. I just pray for her continued recovery, Lord, so that she could be there for her family. And dear Father, as we get into your word tonight, we ask your blessing upon it. We ask your blessing on this nation, Lord God. We ask for your intervention, Lord God. We ask that your church would prosper. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Uh, before I go further, let me thank all of you who are watching. I see a lot of old friends, and uh, I'm just so pleased that uh, you were able to take a few minutes uh, time with us tonight. We're going to be in the book of Acts. We're going to read a couple verses here. And so let's just get right to it here. I'm in Acts chapter 2, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 42. The Bible says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It's a great scripture right there that we have before us with many lessons and many things to take away uh, from it so that we could apply uh, to our lives and to our churches. And uh, right now, I, I must say, our nation, our world, our local communities have, been, have drastically changed in the last three months, as you know. Uh, we have made it to what it appears to be the end of the pandemic. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, everyone watching there, I can't wait to stop wearing this mask. Uh, you know how it is. You're walking down the street. It's getting hot outside. Your face is sweating under the mask. It's not comfortable. Can't wait to stop wearing it. And uh, you notice people are slacking. Now they're wearing it at their neck. They're not even covering their faces with it. Uh, we're living in a different time. Yeah, you walk in the streets, all these masks that you see. Now they're selling them in the street, all kinds of different colors. This is what we're looking at. The world is different. Our, our community is a lot different. And, uh, you know, with, the, with people wearing masks and people wearing them less, and I'm planning to soon just discard it all together. I'm looking forward to that. Give me another week. All right. Um, now, you might say, hold on, preacher, slow down a second. Don't you see the numbers are spiking in different places in the country? And I just want to say to you, before you get yourself worked up into a panic, think about it for a second. They're increasing the testing. The, remember the testing? The first test that we're going on when the pandemic first hit in our country Half those tests or more were not even reliable tests. Even now, people are getting tested multiple times. They test negative, negative, and then positive. Negative, then positive, and they're getting different results. Not all the testing has been reliable. Now we have better testing. Now we have more widespread testing, and now we're saying, oh, look, the numbers are going up. Well, the numbers are going up because now there's accurate tests. So it's to be expected. All right. But uh, it looks like things are getting better. Uh, research scientists are looking uh, at this virus now. The epidemiologists are seeing that even the virus is weakening. This is looking good. We hope for a continued trend in this direction. Now, we could be wrong. The virus may mutate and turn a total uh, 180 turn and start strengthening again. And the people put back the masks and back to the social distancing, but we're hoping the trend continues where we'll have the coronavirus outbreak behind us, Lord willing. Now, with all of this that's going on, you see the protests now. You've got uh, what happened with George Floyd. He was killed by these officers, and you've got the protests. And uh, they're exercising their freedom of speech. I'm not against that. I'm not against that. But what I am against is if people want to protest, but people don't want to pray. I'm against that. I'm against that. You see, 
What I think is as people shout louder and trying to uh, get their voice heard and they're protesting against what happened and against what those officers did, as they protest, they're just shouting loud. So I guess if one is a racist, if one is like that officer that had his knee on the neck of George Floyd, if people are like that, now they're scared into the closet. Oh, wow. Uh, they're getting on the racist now. So I better keep quiet uh, as to my racist views. So now they're scared away. Now they're not vocal. Now they're quiet. Okay, I get it. But hold on. That doesn't change them. Now they're just quiet about what they think, but they're not changed inwardly. If you want to see a real change in our nation, if you want to see God make a real difference, you know what we really need to do is start praying to God again and start looking up. You see, you could do these things in the flesh, but it doesn't mean it's going to change the heart. And that's what this nation needs. This nation doesn't need uh, a change in policy. We need a change in our heart. We need an inward change. And it's sad because this is a time now where God's people are scared to go to church. Isn't that funny how things are now? Now people can protest in the street. They talk about social distancing. They talk about wearing the mask. But when it's time to protest, no one's social distancing. And when it's time to protest... Uh, everyone's out there, they're not obeying the law, they're not paying any mind to the, to the uh, uh, curfews. You've got then the looters and the anarchists and the lawless out there creating destruction. They want to burn churches, they want to rob stores and going on and on with this. And the police, they've got their hands back, they're, they're afraid to get involved. That's what you see in Seattle. They wanted a de-escalation, so the police even abandoned their own precinct. And now the looters, the anarchists, the Antifa, they've created a six or seven block perimeter. It's unbelievable. It's a no-cop zone, they call it, in the city of Seattle. And so what they're doing now is that these lawless people, they have these humongous firearms. They're guarding the place, not letting people go in, out or in. They're not allowing, they, they're checking IDs. They're extorting business owners. If you don't pay this money, you know, we're not going to let you continue to do business here. And the police are not allowed in there. What a lawless situation that is. We need to stop this kind of stuff. And listen to me right now. And this is why I'm the preacher. I'm not here to, to be popular. I'm here to tell the truth. I'm not here so for people could like me. I'm here to speak the word of God. I'm here to take a stand. Now listen to me. I stand for law and order. Those people out there talking about defund the police, first of all, they're in the huge minority. They're in the minority. That's one. Two, those of us who understand, who are rational, we understand that we need the police. We're in this great, much, great bigger minor, uh, majority. However, we don't want to speak out because we're afraid of that 15%. We're afraid of that outlier. We're afraid of what they're going to say to us. It's about time God's people stopped being afraid and spoke out against the injustice, spoke out against the sin, and spoke up for God. Take a stand for Jesus. Listen, we need to stand against this idea of defunding the police. We need to stand for law enforcement. And just for the record, just so people know what kind of person I am, I'm against Black Lives Matter. I'm not for it. That's right. I am not for Black Lives Matter. I believe all lives matter, first of all. Also, the lives of the unborn so I'm against pro-choice, I'm against abortion, I'm against the murder of innocent children. I'm against that. And I'm, and I'm not for Black Lives Matter because the leftists, the wicked, the anti-God, anti-church crowd has taken over Black Lives Matter. And so I'm not supporting that. I'm not supporting the, the, this lawless behavior in the streets. I'm, I'm for law and order. I'm against police officers that abuse their power. I'm against police brutality, but that, that's not me being for Black Lives Matter, not what we're seeing today, not this kind of stuff. Now, 
let's let me get going here I'm looking at the protest they're not obeying social distancing yet some of my pastor friends some of the New York area more New Jersey uh, they try to observe social distancing that some of them had church in their parking lots what they did was they had their church people sit in their cars, see windows closed, sitting in their cars, and the preacher out, outside with their microphone preaching the word of God, and the law enforcement in their local area showed up to write them citations as they practiced their social distancing. Listen to me. Don't anyone who knows me is going to know that I'm not going to sit silent and not talk about that. They want to uh, persecute Christians while they're trying to obey the law and do social distancing. But then when it's protesters yelling in the street, oh, they could do that. They could do whatever they want. They could rob stores. They can break uh, uh, storefronts and, and loot and rob. And law enforcement is going to take a step back. And let me tell you something. They take a step back because uh, citizens are silent. Citizens are reluctant to throw their support behind law enforcement. So law enforcement, feeling the heat, don't want to enforce the law. Well, you know what? For the safety of our communities, for your own safety, for the safety of the street where you live in, I suggest you get behind law enforcement. God forbid it's going to be one of your family members, maybe your mom, maybe your dad, maybe your daughter, maybe one of your children that get shot by one of these thugs um, might get robbed or attacked in the street. God forbid. But that's the reality of the world we live in. Uh, I shared this before and I'll say it again. I don't know one single young person that got shot by a police officer. I'm not saying it never happens. I just don't personally know of them. I read about these stories that happen throughout the nation just like you, but I don't personally know them. However, I know well several young people that got shot by other young people in a lawless environment, gang violence, but no one's protesting that. No one's protesting about the 60 or 70 people that are murdered over the weekend in Chicago on the streets. That's what you get when you defund the police. That's what you have when you have less police officers and police officers who are afraid to enforce the law because the community turned against them. Listen to me, if you're god and you believe the Bible, stop listening to the CNN. Stop listening to NBC and these news networks that try to stir up your anger falsely against the law enforcement that is ordained of God. And they are there for the punishment of evildoers. Open your Bible and read. Understand that we're supposed to pray for our leaders, not fight against them. We're supposed to support them and pray to God that they would have the wisdom to execute their office properly. Listen to me. If we have this selective uh, anger and we get angry for the things they tell us on television to be angry about, but we're not angry about sin. And I'm telling you, uh, the Bible says we're to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we don't seem to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We seem to rather hunger and thirst after popularity. We want the favor of men. We want them to say good of us. And we're afraid to speak out. I'm telling you, we need it. God's people need to start taking a stand. We need to start being vocal. The devil's crowd's vocal, and they're in the minority, the, the lawless ones, okay? And so the minority, because they're so loud, they're able to quiet and scare us who are in the majority into the closet. We need to wake up. I, I would like to address here on this platform this thing about the president, a few days ago, there was a protest and then more lawless behavior around Washington, D.C., near the White House. There was the St. John's Church, who one of these lawless, uh, rotten people, <laughs> wicked, set the church on fire. Thankfully, the, the church didn't burn down, but there was, 
That's a very distressing situation. Uh, they don't have fear of God. They're willing to burn churches down. They, they look at God's people as part of the problem. But let me, let me tell you something. God is our only solution. Not part of the problem. Our only solution. The president, the next day, they clear out the place. They, they talk about tear gas, whatever. Listen to me. If they're engaging in lawless behavior, I don't mind them using strong force to get the situation back under control. I don't mind. The president comes out there, stands in front of the church, holds up a Bible, takes a picture. And the news networks were in an uproar. How dare the president use the Bible in the church as a prop? And they try to stir up the anger of the public. You're supposed to get angry because the president held the Bible in his hand. Listen to me. They said that I'm supposed to get angry because the president used the Bible as a prop. But I'm not so supposed to be angry because the previous administration promoted gay marriage. I'm not supposed to be angry because they want to have three genders. That they want to have gender confusion for the bathrooms. I'm not supposed to be angry because of how they threw out the word of God out of our society. How they all but can't, they canceled Christmas in the White House in the previous administration and brought in Muslim prayers. I'm not against Muslim people, but I'm not for the religion. I'm for Jesus Christ. You can't be for both. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, not Allah, not any other religion. You can't have it both ways. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by, by me. There's not another way. I'm not against those people, but I am for my Savior. So, the president shows his support for the church that was burned. And we're supposed to get angry because the news networks told us to get angry. And sadly, so many of us followed like little sheep and did what the news networks told us we were supposed to do because we can't think for ourselves. But for God-fearing people, I have a lot of confidence in you. So uh, follow my line of reasoning here as I speak to you. On May the 4th, the president, President Trump, signed an executive order promoting religious liberty. Oh, you didn't hear about that, did you, from your news networks? But they don't want you to support the president. They want to condition your thinking. They, they want to dictate the narrative and paint a picture that's false for you. He signed an executive order on May the 4th for the sake of religious liberty, giving pastors, and preachers, and teachers liberty to speak on political views. He signed that executive order on May the 4th. Myself as a pastor, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I feel the support of the White House in my ministry. I feel that. That's a real thing. So as... They're trying to get us to turn against uh, the, the current administration. Uh, I recognize which administration is supporting us and which ones are working against us. I see this one as supporting people of faith. On May the 22nd, that's very recently, friends. This is just the last couple of weeks. Just the last couple of weeks. May 22nd, on a Friday, the president got up uh, on television and said how churches are essential, he demanded of the governors to allow people of faith to have their worship services. Listen to me, I appreciate that. That very Sunday, I decided we should start having church again. We went nine weeks without having church. Most churches stopped. A few continued. And I took my cap to them. I thought the right thing to do at the time was to stop having service because I didn't know how dangerous this virus was. I, I think I did the right thing. 
I, but, I, but you never know, really. Uh, nonetheless, uh, May the 22nd, he made that announcement. We had church that, that on the 24th, our first Sunday back. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And of course, uh, just only days ago, he took that picture with the Bible. I see that as a gesture that was sincere and in support of the, that church, St. John's, and of all the churches. I took that as support. And no, I'm not angry at him for doing it. No, I don't think it's a problem. And if you look at the facts, and if you're not so blinded by the news media, maybe you might see the truth too. Pastor, I don't agree with you. That's fine. I'm not here to be agreed with. I'm here to tell you the truth. I don't support the looters. I don't support defunding the police. And I don't support Black Lives Matter. Not what it's become. I believe Black Lives Matter and all lives matter and blue lives matter. But I am not for uh, these leftist, wicked, violent anarchists that have hijacked the situation. I'm hoping that law enforcement would do their job, take their stand, even though they're unpopular amongst a lot of people. And I'm hoping that they enforce the law. And I hope preachers will also take their stand. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up for righteousness. Stand for the word of God. I'm calling on God's people to take your stand now. Not be afraid of the mob who want to shout you down. Not be afraid of losing popularity or people criticizing you, but to be courageous. Listen to me. The Bible says, woe to them when people think well of you. Now, I did read a scripture this evening, didn't I? And I do want to talk to you about that. Again, I'm here to preach the truth of the word of God. It says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 15, it says this of God's church. It says, and Paul speaking to Timothy, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church, the pillar, I'm sorry, I'm, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You want to hear the truth? Go to church. Go to church. You want to hear the truth? Listen to good preaching and you'll hear the truth. You want the truth? Let me introduce you to the one man, the God man, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of the truth. No wonder the devil wants the churches closed. No wonder uh, the governments, the local governments throughout our country have felt compelled to really drop the hammer on the churches while letting others break the rules. How convenient that is. I say to God's people, you need to take your stand. And if you can go to a supermarket to buy food, if you can go to work, listen to me, you can go to church. You don't need to stay home anymore. Amen. We stand for truth. We stand for liberty. And we stand for law and order. When COVID hit, God's people stopped going to church. Churches closed their doors. It's understandable. This virus was a real thing, okay? But it's been, it, the numbers are decreasing dramatically. It's time to start going to church again. It seems now that God's people don't seem to mind sitting out from church. Now God's people don't want to go to church anymore. Listen to me again. If you can go to work, if you can go to the supermarket, if you can go to the park, bless God, you can go to church. Glory to God. President was right. That's right. Some of us don't like it when someone's right. Well, we don't like to hear the words, I told you so. And for some of you, you really hate it when it's the president, this president. 
How dare he be right? But he was right. Church is essential. We stopped having church and look at Minneapolis. Can you make the connection? You take God out of the equation and the society descends into lawlessness and anarchy and disorder. And God is the God of order. He's the God of justice. He is righteousness. He is peace. You're not going to have peace without Jesus Christ. It is not possible. But when you have Jesus, you can have peace. You cannot have love and see all men as created equally without Jesus Christ. You will always suffer some type of bias. You will always struggle with the flesh in that area. But with Jesus Christ, you can get along with your fellow man. Church is essential. Jesus is essential. And for any of us who don't really understand the word essential meaning, necessary it is necessary to have church to have a functioning society where liberty is a centerpiece where people can move about freely and work and raise their families if you don't have god and the fear of god in the center of that that freedom descends into chaos because we cannot manage ourselves, because we are all sinners. The Bible says so, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. You take God out of the equation, and we fall apart as a nation. Amen. Glory to God. We need him. If that, you, you don't understand that? You need him. He holds your very breath in his hands. But nowadays, God's people don't seem to think so the same. God's people are growing apathetic. They're sitting at home, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, but we don't really want to go. And now you see the nation descend into chaos, and we throw up our hands. What are we going to do? What's wrong? What's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. You haven't honored God. You've cast God aside. You threw the word of God out of your life. That's what happened. Instead of standing outside and praying, just go home and pray. I got that wrong. Instead of standing outside and protesting, we should be in our prayer closets praying. Praying for God's intervention. Praying for God to act and to move in the hearts of men and women and young people in our nation. In our passage in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42, we have a powerful uh, example of what a church should be and what the church was back in the day, right after the ascension of Jesus Christ when he went to his father. And in the story that we have, it, these scriptures happen right on the tail end of Pentecost and 3,000 souls were added to God's church and people were excited because now they realized that they had victory in Jesus Christ. Uh, we had victory over the grave. He's risen. We have forgiveness of sin, a hope for heaven. People were all kinds of excited. And so here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in Breaking of bread and in prayers. Let's break down that verse just a little bit really quickly. First of all, let me just call to your attention these two words. Continued steadfastly. Continued steadfastly. Listen to me. You sitting at home, not going to church, not reading your Bible, not praying. That's not continuing steadfastly, my friend. Just letting you know right now, continuing steadfastly is, gives me the idea that they continued to worship together, attending church, and they did it with a spirit of determination. They were willing to go to church when it was not convenient. They were willing to go to church when it wasn't easy. They were willing to step up for the Savior. It didn't matter to them what the world was saying. It didn't matter what uh, persecution they were going to face. They were willing to go to God's house to worship him because they were excited about the Savior that brought salvation to them. They continued steadfastly. That's, by the way, this model is what we need today. 
God's people need to get steadfast about this thing going to church. Again, if you could go to the supermarket, if you could run around town, do your errands, do this, that, and the other, you can go to church. Glory to God. All right. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. I count four elements right here. Steadfastly describes the following four elements. All right? Very quickly. Doctrine and fellowship. If you, that's why I preach Jesus Christ. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I believe in the doctrine of of the deity of Jesus Christ. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Bible says in 1 John 5, sir, uh, 1 John 5, verse 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. How about John chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same in the beginning was with God. Uh, let me just stop right there to say, I stand on the doctrine of the word of God. I'm not here to create my own opinions and present them to you as though they were truth. I am here to take the word of God and apply it to what's going on today. Apply it to what I understand God's people need right here, right now. I pray to God and ask him for wisdom as to what I need to speak in God's church. And listen to me. The people continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine. The doctrine included the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus rose again from the dead. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of all mankind. Jesus loved this world. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Understand this. It doesn't say that God only loved the white people. Uh, God only loved the, bl the black people. Black lives matter. Jesus wasn't a black lives protester. Jesus died for the world. He died for all people. God, the Bible says, Jesus said these words, preach the gospel to every creature, to every kindred. God said to Abraham, the kindreds of the earth will be blessed on your account. That all the nations would be able to partake in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the apostles' doctrine? Salvation. What's the apostles' doctrine? Salvation by grace. What's the apostles' doctrine? Salvation by grace. Forgiveness of sin. Hope for heaven. A new beginning. A new life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Again, the only solution for this broken society, the only solution for this nation is a person called God and his son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for, for all mankind. That's what we need. The apostles' doctrine. If any person would come to Jesus Christ, they would be saved and born again. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call upon Jesus Christ for salvation, he will save you. That's the apostles' doctrine, my friend. And they continued steadfastly in that. They were not shaken from that. These people were too excited to now walk away from the doctrine. Are you kidding me? This stuff is too good. Why am I going to walk away from Jesus now when I know he's the risen Messiah? When I know he gave his, his life to pay for my sins? I'm going to be steadfast with that one, brother. Amen. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. For those of you who are just joining, we're in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And fellowship. Some people think that it's okay to just sit in your house and just watch the TV preacher and call it a day. Now listen. For some weeks, that's all we had. Right now, we don't have a church building, so here we are in a uh, doing this video. We're not doing this video this way because um, we're 
we don't think it's safe to have church. We're doing this right now because uh, our church needs a building. By the way, all, I'm asking all God's people, pray for Family Baptist Church. We're looking for something. We're looking for a permanent home. We've got a wonderful church family, wonderful people that love God. And uh, we have a place to have church this coming Sunday. But it's a very temporary situation. And in the next few weeks, we don't know where we're going to be. And I'm asking for you to pray. This Sunday, it's at 2314 Snyder Avenue. Someone's asking right now. 1.30 p.m. Now listen. Fellowship. God's people are supposed to get together and fellowship. We're supposed to fellowship. We're not supposed to worship God in a vacuum. That's not what these people did. If they didn't do it and it was working for them, why do I want to do something different? Just saying. Which is to say, if we are going to fellowship, folks, we're going to have to get along with one another, aren't we? The Bible commands we're to love one another. And so with love that binds us with this doctrine that unifies us, we will be just fine. We'll be strong together. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Okay? And then there's two more things mentioned. And they also fall under this umbrella of steadfastly. They continue steadfastly in the next two things. Here they are. That third one is my favorite one, by the way. I like that one. Do you see that, friends, for those of you following in the Bible? Doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Well, I'm not going to spend a long time talking about that third element because I look at that one as the easy one. That's the one that I naturally gravitate to so that... I don't have to beat over your head this third point. I'm just going to say it in passing, and I'm going to let your appetite do the rest. Amen? I'm going to let your appetite take over. Breaking of bread. I can't tell you how much I love it when our church gets together and the people of our church start cooking and we have food together. I love it. I didn't get like this just because I didn't go to people's house and eat. Listen to me, I do a lot of that good stuff. We've got some really talented people in our church. Really, really talented cooks in our church. Glory to God. They know what they're doing when it comes to that kitchen. And when we get together, listen to me, let me just put it to you like this, friends. <laughs> the people, they continued steadfastly, not only in the doctrine, the doctrine's great, glory to God, the doctrine. Not only in the fellowship, fellowship's great. We get along with one another, we love one another, 1.30 p.m. But also in the breaking of bread, in the breaking of bread, amen. So, and then the last one, perhaps maybe the most, Along with the doctrine, the most important one. I think the doctrine and this one are the most important. And they tie together our fellowship. They tie together our breaking of bread. And it's the prayer. It's the prayer. Amen. They continued steadfastly in that. This nation, what does this nation need? Needs prayer. Needs prayer. I'm saying this to you folks tonight. Take some time out and skip a meal fast and pray for this nation. I, I don't think I would ever see the day when local communities in our nation would be forcibly seized by anarchists with automatic weapons. I never thought I'd see that day in my lifetime. And we're there right now. That's the city of Seattle. You see the images on the news networks. They've got automatic firearms. And those aren't police. They are not National Guard. They're not the SWAT team. They're the anarchists whose goal is to bring down local governments and to bring instability and to take away yours and my right to freely worship our God. Don't think for one second 
Don't think for one second that you're going to have the freedom to serve God that you have now if those people took power. They're already extorting people for money. He says, if you want to have your business here, you're going to have to pay. They're taking money from people as we speak. Again, we need law enforcement to take their stand. But we need God's people to back them up and not be silent. The devil wants you to be silent. But we need to take a stand. Take a stand for God. Take a stand for people that uh, take a stand for us. Amen. When you have a president that stands up there and says, you know what? I don't care what your governor says. If, you have, if your governor gives you a problem, you send them to me. That's basically what he said. You can have church. Church is essential. If he stands up for me and stands up for God's people, I'll stand for him. And, and they do shoot the arrows at him, don't they? Well, if I got Facebook friends, I do have Facebook friends. They despise this president. I've got friends locally right here. They, they hate what I'm saying. And they're going to have to get over it because I know it's true. And the preacher can't say it. Who can? Glory to God. I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to speak the truth. So, we're almost done tonight. All right? We're almost done. Okay. So, church is essential. We need to make it a priority to go to church. And uh, church is uh, not to be... Uh, a talent show. It's not a platform for entertainment, music, and theater. We have music in the church, but music is not to be this thing to entertain the people. That's why I don't like the worship services that look more like rock concerts. I don't understand how they thought that God was more pleased with that. That looks more pleasing to us who like the rock culture. But I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to speak the truth. I like the traditional worship more because it's different from the worldly crowd. And I don't want to look like the world. I want to follow God. That's how I feel about that. And there's a lot of God's people out there who love God, but they go to churches where they resemble rock concerts. And, and I believe a lot of them have good doctrine and they love God, but I just... I, I'm not down with the way they do their services. But you know what? If they're preaching the truth, I'm not against them. I'm for them. I guess I'm just saying right now where I stand personally myself. God's church is not a platform for entertainment. Uh, it's not a platform for everyone to show their talent so that you could think there's something special. If we have talent, it's so that we could show that talent to give God glory, not bring the glory to ourselves. Understand that. Uh, the church is not a place for the preacher to stand up behind a pulpit to give cle a cleverly uh, crafted, watered down use of the Bible without actually teaching the Bible. There's teaching from the Bible, but not actually teaching the Bible. It's like they use the Bible to teach while avoiding to give the truth of it. And I'm just saying right now, God's. Preachers need to get serious about the word and take their stand for Jesus Christ. Not water down the word, not pull back the punches, so to speak, but give the word of God in earnest, not fearing uh, what the people will say, but admonishing God's people and preaching righteousness and best of all, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what God's church is for, not to win a popularity contest so that the, the unsaved crowd likes you. Those who are unsaved, they're supposed to not like you because you're preaching the truth. We want people to like us. Believe me, I do. I want people to like me. But not at the expense of pleasing God. That's, that's serious business, especially for a preacher. Because all of us preachers are answerable to God. For our message. Not to the state. Not to the angry mob. We're answerable to God. We're not supposed to use God's church for profit. A profit platform. It's not supposed to be used for social justice. We could speak about it. But that's not the purpose of the church. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The church of the living God. 
The church of the living God, our number one job is to preach the gospel, not get involved in, in social justice in such a way that it overshadows our message about the kingdom of God. Jesus preached this. This was his message. He said, repent ye and believe the gospel for the kingdom of God is at hand. And believe me, they had social justice issues, but Jesus did not preach what, uprise against the Roman government. That wasn't his message. His message was obey the government, obey the law, but stand for salvation in the kingdom. Okay, we continue. We have more critics in our church than prayer warriors sometimes. We need more prayer warriors, amen? We want to affect change, but we don't want to win souls. The protesters want to affect change and they're not ashamed. They yell and they snarl and they hiss. But God's people hide in a corner, not wanting people to know that they stand with Jesus Christ. That is truly the problem of our day and age today. I'm going to leave that point out. I don't need that one. Sometimes I write something in my notes that's of the flesh. I could leave that one out. Listen, we have talented. Now, listen, I'm moving into a different phase in the message. This is to the church. Amen. Uh, our church, Family Baptist Church, needs to mobilize. We need to get serious. It is, the kingdom of God is at hand. We need to build our church again. Amen. We need to go forward. Your church needs you. Amen. This pastor needs you. Amen. All right. We need a building. We need your prayers. We need your presence. OK, we have talented singers in our church. We're going to get the choir going. Amen. But listen to me. Wouldn't it be sad if the talented singers in our church didn't want to sing? And yet the Hollywood come, crowd comes around, recognizes the same talent of a Christian young person and says, hey, come sing with us. Introduce you to a bunch of famous and talented people, worldly people, but talented and famous. And that same person didn't want to sing in church, but they're going to come back to church and brag about all the famous people they met. And I think that's ungodly. That's wicked. We need to give our talents first to God, second and last to the world. The world shouldn't have first access to your talents, but you're slow to stand up for God and to sing for him. That's a shame. God is the one that gave you the talent. If you have a voice to sing solo, you need to hurry up and sing solo in church. If you have a voice that can, you can participate in the choir, I don't know why you're sitting around sitting on your hands. You need to get up and get busy for God and use your talent for God. We have all kinds of talented people. We have all kinds of people that are kind of confused about what they should do, what their next move is. Well, glory to God. Sometimes your pastor will get in your face every once in a while and tell you what you need to hear. You need to sing for God, amen? It wouldn't be right for me to not sing and lead my own singing. It's right for me to do that because I, I could sing a little bit, amen? And if you know how to sing, you need to sing too. Use your talents for God. God's church needs that. Our society needs that because our society needs the church, amen? The apostles uh, these people, these new Christians continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. They continued steadfastly. Sad that talented singers, uh, if money's involved, Hollywood's involved, count me in. But then when the preacher asks you to sing, oh, I don't know, let me pray about it. Oh, I don't know. Listen to me, don't be that way. It's a privilege and an honor. We have to jump at the opportunity to serve God. Amen? Kingdom of God is at hand. It's, it's not the time to sit and wait. What are you waiting for? As the world burns, what are we waiting for? Just saying. People withhold their talent from God. They don't want to serve in the church and give their talents. People withhold their time from God. They don't want to serve. Um, that's sad. It's sad. You know, uh, we have a bus route. People don't want to join the bus route. They don't want to help. They don't want to ride the bus. That's sad. People don't want to step up and get their CDL license. But at the same time, they want to complain about the preacher driving. That's sad. That's God's people now. 
God's people need to step up and answer the call. The kingdom of God's at hand, and, and the soul of a child is just as valuable as a soul that, that has grown and has a job that can give. Just as valuable. Listen to me. God's <laughs> counting the score. Believe me. People don't want to give their time. They don't want to give their talent. And they don't want to give their money. They hold on to that money. Listen to me. That's not right. When you die, you're leaving all that money behind. The least you can do, friends, the least you can do is give God what's his, that 10%, and tithe. That's the least you can do. I've known people to give much more than their tithe because of their love and generosity for the Savior, because of the moving of the Holy Spirit in their heart to give. And I'm not telling people what they're supposed to give outside of the tithe. I'm going to let God deal with you about that because the Spirit of God will tell you if you should give more. But it's clear from the Scripture that we should all, 10% uh, is a starting point, that we, we give to God a tithe. That's for the preacher, that's for the people, that's for all of us, because God wants to see his church prosper. Glory to God. God doesn't want to see his church suffer. Amen? That's not right. The church is not to be treated with neglect. And I fear sometimes that's what we see. God's church is met with neglect, and we don't give what we're supposed to give to it. Amen? And the pastor is not to be targeted with your critique. That's not how the scripture says to run a church. Some people think that the, the pastor is supposed to field all critique. That's not what the scripture says. The people are not to be the object of your contempt. People say, people say, oh, God's church, the church is full of hypocrites. If you're the one that's saying that, you're the biggest hypocrite. You're bigger than the hypocrites you call out. And the church of God might be, the, the church might have a bunch of hypocrites in it. But let me tell you something. That's not your job to say. It's not. And it's not an excuse from you. For you to sit out from going to church. If that is what your feeling is, we need to repent. We need to come to God. Listen to me. The church people are not an object for you to, to talk about and to be the object of your contempt. If you are to do anything, we're to pray for them. Amen. We are to love one another. We are to weep with them that weep and to rejoice with them that rejoice. Not sit back on our easy chair, do nothing, and criticize the church as the nation burns. I don't think so. That's not the truth of God. God's people need to get serious about God and get back on the horse again, so to speak. Amen? Amen. God's name is to be exalted, his person adored, his presence cherished. We're supposed to love God with all of our strength, with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and we're supposed to love one another as ourselves God is to be exalted he is to be loved adored and feared the pastor he should be supported and followed he's even worthy of double honor I'm a humble person I would not have said that but that's what the word of God says I just have to tell it to you because that's what the Bible says preachers worthy of double honor and by the way I've learned this from example well, the more I had the church's support, the more I saw the church grow. The more I felt the criticism, the more people didn't show up. You know what I think it is? I think you can't fool the Spirit of God. You attack your preacher, and the Holy Spirit leaves the church. You support your preacher, and you get behind him, and the Holy Spirit of God manifests himself more strongly in the church. And the things we can't do in the flesh... The Holy Spirit makes happen. God said, I'm the one that brings the increase. We don't bring the increase. You could work harder, invite more people, knock on more doors. You can work harder, work your fingers to the bone. But if you don't have the spirit of God, you want to run your mouth however you want to do it. You want to tear down the preacher. You want to tear down God's people. You want to be a gossip in the church. The Holy Spirit is going to be grieved. I've seen that. 
in God's church. I've witnessed that firsthand. Glory to God. Well, by the way, sunshine or rain, I give God the glory. Amen? Because not me. It's God. We're not here for ourselves, right? You're not even here for me. You're here for God. Amen. God's name is to be exalted, the pastor supported, and the church people are to be loved, cherished, and prayed for. If we heed this message, we will see God's church prosper. As God's church prospers, and as the gospel goes forth, and we pray for revival in this nation, that'll do many times over more than the protest that you see, even from the good ones. We give God the glory. How about this verse? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, not complain, bicker, and murmur. No, pray, humble, seek my, my, seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Glory to God. We, we yearn for God's healing in this country. So what we need. We need the presence of God. And it's not going to come because we're so awesome. We're not. He is. He is awesome. We're not awesome. But if we would just do what he says, support one another, pray for one another, Holy Spirit does the rest. Just know that. Amen. Glory to God. I got on some of you. I, this is some kind of hard preaching. Talked about everything under the sun. But please don't misunderstand. I love you. There's some of you that half the stuff I said you don't agree with. I mixed in a little politics, a little current events you think i'm crazy i'm not crazy i know i'm right that's why i said it for everyone to hear but you might think so but listen to me the fact that we might disagree doesn't mean i don't love you i love you and if you don't know jesus christ as savior i want you to be saved i want you to know the same savior that i know amen i want you to know him i want you to love him because he's worthy he's worthy we're getting ready to say goodbye for this evening. I, I see the little chat on, on the screen as I'm preaching. So I'm, I'm able to talk to you and read your chat a little bit at the same time. And uh, so church is at 1.30 p.m. 1.30 p.m. It's at the Gospel Tabernacle Church Building. The address is 2314 Snyder Avenue. 2314 Snyder Avenue. It's closer to the corner at Bedford. It's between Bedford and Woods Place. Uh, it's a nice situation for the time being. Man, I wish we could be there all the time. Beautiful church building. And the people have been gracious to let us use their church while they're waiting to have church. It's funny that all the things I said in consideration, they're not having church has allowed us the opportunity to have church in their building for the time being. Uh, nonetheless, we'll make the best of it. Amen. And so at one thirty, we go about one thirty to 3. And uh, we've had some pretty uh, wonderful services there up to this point. Looking forward to seeing a bunch of you there. We're looking forward to giving God the glory, preaching the word of God, uh, having the joy of the Lord. Amen. And, um, and hey, bring a friend. Amen. Bring a friend. And we, it is, we are hopeful. There is a piano. Amen. They have everything there. They have everything sound, the works. Amen. Anybody want to play the drums? We got the drums there. Everything, the works. Amen. All right. If we could fit that into our service. I don't think we can. All right. But um, so th that's the information. That's this Sunday. Uh, our Thursdays will continue like this on video until we can get our situation worked out. And uh, it's very possible that will be in the very near future in just a couple of short weeks. So stay tuned. The announcements are coming fast and furious. All right. Again, we're asking for people to pray for our church. We are actively looking for a building. We're looking at listings. Amen. All right. We're actively looking. Uh, we believe that the Lord would want us to have a permanent home. It seems like 
this is the time to really search. So I want you to pray that God drops something down from heaven, amen, and God opens the door for us. Again, we love you. Uh, let us know how we could pray for you and be there for you. Again, let me ask you to remember uh, Jessica Garcia's family and the passing of her father, Juan Gonzalez. Uh, also pray for Indra Harrigan. And uh, let me call out two other names um, for Alberto and Kimberly. A dear sister in our church is praying for them for their salvation. Alberto and Kimberly, if you would remember their names. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll say goodbye for this evening. Dear Father, thank you for this day and for your goodness. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this wonderful gift, the church, the pillar uh, and ground of the truth, Lord God. We're, we've experienced so much joy sitting in the halls of your house, Lord God. It's also called the house of prayer, called of all nations. So thank you, God, for it. Lord God, all the joy in my life has come under the roof of a local church. Thank you, Father. It was under the roof of a local church I accepted your son as my savior. Thank you, Father. We love you, dear Father. We worship and adore you, dear Father. Dear Father, give us grace, give us power. Help us to be shining and burning lights for righteousness and, and for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord God, so we can bring you glory so that we can win souls, Lord God. Now, protesters are allowed. May our example, may our voice be louder than theirs for love, for salvation, for Jesus Christ. Dear Father, we pray that same Savior, Jesus, your blessed Son, would be Alberto and Kimberly's Savior too. We pray for them. We yearn for their salvation. Oh God, we yearn that you would soften their hearts, that you would make uh, evident to them your presence and your desire to see them saved. Thank you, Father. We love you, dear Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. We will see you on Sunday. For those that can make it. Amen. Because some of you are out of town. God bless you.